Welcome everyone. Today I'll be talking about the field of bioinformatics and also going over a case study explaining the steps we perform for a target enrichment analysis using the whole exome sequencing data for human genome. In our agenda, we will start out by talking about what is bioinformatics and then move to the different areas within the field of bioinformatics followed by a case study that focuses on targeted enrichment workflow to call germline variants, followed by a quick summary, and then a Q&A. So the field of bioinformatics is complex and exciting. It spans multiple disciplines as you see in this figure right here. And as you know, the main field integrates biology and computer science which involves analyzing contents of DNA, RNA, proteins, etc., and trying to understand complex biological systems through these analyses. It also integrates statistics that can be used by programming tools to assess the significance of a metric, or even create a new tool where it would integrate computer science statistics and maths. It also encompasses biochemistry and chemistry where we can do an in silico drug discovery using bioinformatics. And in the coming slides, we are also going to see within bio biology itself, there's different disciplines. In this slide, we see genomics, where it studies the structure and function of DNA sequence of an organism. Epigenomics that studies mechanisms involved with gene expression. Transcriptomics, which studies RNA transcripts that show an overview of highly expressed or suppressed genes. And these come under next generation sequencing or NGS, where we use the sequence of biological polymers to get insights on our complex biological systems. Next, we have the field of proteomics, where we study the protein structure and how a change in the structure of the protein can affect downstream functions. Metabolomics, studying small molecules comprising of substrates and products of metabolic processes to get insights on this biological system of ours. For this webinar, we'll be focusing on a genomic workflow that focuses further on target enrichment studies. Since whole genome sequencing is expensive and does not provide the depth of information, and precision that's required to decipher the roles of individual genes or investigate rare and low frequency genetic variants, targeted next generation sequencing enables us to have this high throughput and cost effective analysis focusing on specific regions of interest. So as you see, for target enrichment workflow, what we are gonna start off is DNA extraction and then library preparation that involves a series of steps where we are doing fragmentation, end repair, A-tailing, adapter ligation, and library amplification. After which we perform target enrichment and then these libraries are sequenced using a sequencer. And post sequencing, we analyze the data generated using open source tools. For our case, Sequencing data from genomic li DNA libraries are prepared using the Kappa Hyperexome V2 that is designed to capture more content from key genomic databases. We use the Avenio Edge system, which is a fully automated IVD liquid handler, and it does an end-to-end -end library preparation, target enrichment, quantification, normalization, and pooling. Once we have our three libraries prepared from the Avenio Edge system, we then move to sequencing where we use Illumina's NovaSeq and sequence our data. And then we are gonna move towards the bioinformatics side, which is the target enrichment analysis. So once we have the libraries that are sequenced, Illumina creates binary base calls or BCL files that's, as the name suggests, in a binary format and represents 
raw data output of sequencing run. We then perform demultiplexing, converting these BCL files to FASTQ files. FASTQ is a text-based sequence file format that is generated from the BCL file and it also stores both the raw sequence data and quality scores. Now this falls under primary analysis for next generation sequencing. So we then perform a QC to assess sequencing quality and if everything looks good, we move ahead to adapter trimming quality filtering. Now in our example, down sampling was also performed to make the samples more comparable and also normalize the coverage. I have written, as that, or written this as optional right now, but in our case study, we do down sample to around 60 million base pairs. Next, we map these reads to a reference genome. And in this case, it's gonna be AG38. This step is also known as alignment. We get a BAM file, which we then mark and remove duplicates from. And at this stage, we also calculate coverage and capture statistics like on target rate fold 80. Now the next step will be to call genomic variants and filter them based on the quality of the variant. The whole thing here consists of secondary analysis followed by variant annotation that falls under tertiary analysis. We'll be going over these steps in details in the next few slides. And our team has also wrapped this pipeline in a container solution to help evaluate kappa target enrichment. Now, starting with demultiplexing, as you know, the BCL files are raw data generated by Illumina. So the real-time analysis software with an Illumina rights base and the confidence in the call as a quality score within these BCL files. We then use Illumina's BCL convert to demultiplex sequencing data and convert the BCL files to FASTQ files. Now, the input for BCL convert is a sample sheet, an example of which can be found within Illumina's connected software page and the path to the BCL files. So once we have these two information, BCL convert converts these BCL files to FASTQ files and in our case, we have four lanes, lane one, lane two, lane three, lane four, where for per sample, what we do next is we concatenate or merge these files per lane and create a FASTQ file per sample. Now, FASTQ files, as I mentioned, is a text-based sequence file format that stores both raw data and the quality scores. Now, for a single run, one FASTQ file is created for each sample per flow cell lane. But for a paired end run, two FASTQ files are created for each sample for each lane. So, in our example, we'll be working with paired N. So we have two FASTQ files that are created for each sample. We now move on to the next step in our workflow. Now, this is adapter trimming, quality filtering and downsampling. Why do we perform adapter trimming? So here we have a DNA insert of size 120 base pairs with adapters on either side. And in this case, we are performing a run of 150 base pair. Now, in this case, we see this run is running into the adapter region. This is a case where adapter trimming comes into play. We trim off the excess of the adapters and this FASTQ file would then be used for quality filtering. So quality filtering is discarding the low quality reads that have a low quality score 
This is to ensure we are using good quality data for our downstream analysis. Now fast P is used both for adapter trimming and quality filtering. Downsampling is performed using SeqDK and as I said in our example we do downsample to 60 million reads because we want to make our samples more comparable and also normalize the coverage. The next step is to map the reads to a reference genome. Now in this case, it's going to be GRCH38 or AG38. We use BWA-MEM to map these reads to the reference genome and convert it to a BAM file format. So here we have a reference genome, the reads, and they're mapped to our reference genome. Now BAM files are basically a binary file format containing all the alignment information of various sequences that are mapped against the reference sequence. We use GATK tools to clean up paired read information. So it ensures that two mates of a pair are actually in the file since we are working with paired and reads. So sometimes prior filtering may remove one mate of a pair. And here I'm showing an example of one FASTQ file that's mapped to the reference genome but it's also going to have its other paired and read where maybe that mate might not exist. In that case, fix mate will run through the file, update the flag in the alignment file, the BAM file, if it cannot find the mate anymore. So using this information, next it's going to sort the BAM file based on chromosomes. So starting from chromosome one, two, and going forward. So now we have our BAM file. Next, we are going to move to mark and remove duplicates. So duplicate reads map precisely to the same location as other reads. It is important to mark the duplicate, duplicate reads as they may introduce bias in your variant calling. Also, in order to eliminate overrepresentation of these sequences, duplicate reads are marked. Duplicate reads may arise through PCR or where a single library is amplified, resulting in excess of that same library from sequencing, where sequencing in excess may result in increased duplicate reads or RNA-seq in order to observe lowly expressed transcripts, we may over sequence high expressed transcripts, increasing levels of duplication. So a duplicate flag is added within the BAM file, and then you can either move ahead with your analysis as is by marking the duplicates, or you can remove these duplicates. Even if you don't remove the duplicates, the results do not change significantly. So once this step is completed, we then use this BAM file to calculate coverage and capture statistics. So this is the result for three technical replicates. We see every replicate has a 60 million reads this is the total number of reads that we used for downsampling. Next, we move on to the duplication rate, which is low for all the samples. The mapping rate, it's 100% for all the samples. So all the reads have mapped to the reference genome. The alignment error rate, which is low. Now this error rate is the ratio of total collected edit distance to the number of mapped bases. Next, the fraction of targets at least with at least 30x coverage depth is around 90%, which is good. Next, we have our fold 80 base penalty. So here, a lower value, as we see, indicates less variability among the coverage of individual targets. So a hypothetical a hypothetical case of perfect uniformity would have fold 80 base penalty of 1. So 
it gives you an idea about the coverage for individual targets. On target rate, that represents percent bases that fall within the target region. So here we have around 80% that falls within those target region. Now I'll walk through the variant calling and filtering process. We use deep variant and this is a deep learning based variant caller that takes aligned reads, the BAM files, and calls variants, reporting them in a standard VCF format that I'll be showing in a bit. It detects single nucleotide variants or SNVs. And as you see here, there's a single nucleotide chain. So the sample has G, whereas the reference has A. It also detects insertions or deletions or indels, where one or more nucleotide are deleted or there's additional nucleotides that are inserted within the sequence. And once deep variant generates this VCF file, we then use SNPF to annotate the variants and determining if it has, the variants have a high, medium or low impact and also adding additional information within the info field of a VCF file, which we will be seeing in a bit. Now, based on these annotations that are provided by SNPF, SNPSift is used to filter the variants based on quality scores, the impact and everything. So, this is the output of the variant calling and filtering. Here, it's a VCF file and we usually parse this file if we know the list of variants we need to look at. And let me go back again. So on the top of the VCF file, it contains information of the data that the file contains, any abbreviations of those information, followed by chromosomes. And then we see a list of variants with a filter and also provides information on genotype, read depth, allele frequency information. So what SNPF does is it adds more information in the info column, like predicting the effect of the variant. And it also adds if the variant is a high impact, medium or low. And that's how SNPSIF filters the variants. Next, we look at a table that shows percent of deletions, insertions and SNVs. And in our case study, we see most of the variants are SNVs. We also have this transition to transversions ratio. For whole exome, it is generally around 2.8. So a significant deviation from the expected value could indicate artifactual variants causing a bias. So if your TS by TV ratio is too low, your call set likely has more false positives as well. So in summary, bioinformatics is not just computer science and biology, but can be expanded into multiple disciplines. If we go the route to understand biological polymers like DNA, RNA, protein, etc., there are plenty of tools available online that we can use to build a pipeline. Today, we did see the use of these tools and how they work in analyzing the targeted enrichment data. Targeted enrichment workflow enable sensitive and precise detection of germline SNVs or single nucleotide variants and small insertions or deletions called as indels. To make this process easier, our team has wrapped the workflow as a container-based solution to streamline the bioinformatics analysis of Kappa TE datasets for germline detection, variant detection. And the container includes quality filtering, trimming, optional downsampling if needed, followed by alignment, generation of TE metrics, and germline variant calling. Thank you.